what you have all come here for this evening. Supporting, born this way, supporting your 2S LGBTQ plus youth. Um, this is a presentation um, by the Positive Space Network at the invitation of Halton Families for Families, organized uh, by Halton Families for Families and with the support of PFLAG Halton. First, I wanna get us situated into time, space, and context. The Reach Out Center for Kids houses the Positive Space Network, and Rock is on the traditional and treaty territories of uh, the Haudenosaunee people, and also the traditional territories of the neutral people and the Anishinaabe people. The Positive Space Network has a particular relationship to uh, Indigenous communities on this land and uh, and beyond. Uh, we're very we're aware that gender and sexual identities across cultural contexts uh, pre-existed our uh, the European understandings that we know today as LGBTQ+. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be two-spirit and how PSN strives to be in allyship with, uh, with two-spirit people. Feel free to feel yourselves on the ground, feel your feet on the ground and feel the, feel your own body on the surface that you're sitting on. It could be a couch or a chair or a bed and see if you can sense any sense of support that you're experiencing or that you can draw from that sensation. This is doing two things. This is bringing us into a mindset where we can be fully present. And it's, it's also helping, um, it's helping us to become um, sort of regulated in our own systems. And that's something we're gonna talk about as well. I do wanna invite you to, at the top of the screen, there's a little checker, uh, sorry, at the beginning, at the top of the speaker screen, there's a little checker box. I welcome you to click that and scroll through and just take a look. If you wanna take your, your, if you wanna share your camera, you can. Um, that's at the bottom of your screen. And I just welcome you to take a look at who's here. You might recognize some names. Feel free to wave, say hey to one another. I think I know you, Maria Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. So these are the people that we're all here with this evening. How cool that across space and, and, and distance, we have the technology to connect with each other right here, right now. In order for us to do our best job, we're gonna need some participation from you in the form of these agreements. Number one, we want you to honor the privacy and confidentiality of one another. What this means is that the learnings that you gain here this evening are for you to take with you far and wide. The, the content, the spe specifics of someone's story need to stay here. So that's what we mean by privacy and confidentiality. Take the learning with you, leave the stories here. Curiosity and respectful questions are necessary. This means that you, um, you are welcome, like you might be coming to this workshop thinking that oh, I should already know this by now, or this is something that I've heard a million times. I'm sure everybody's already aware of what it means. So, but I, I encourage you to ask those questions, the questions that the like FH is the fearfully asked questions, the questions where you're, you're nervous about, about what people might think about you for asking it. Most likely, if you have a question, other people on this, on this webinar have the same question. As long as the questions are respectful, we're, uh, we're going to do our best to get to all the questions at the end of this presentation. Please participate fully and with your whole self. This means this is a great time to put your phone on silent. There's research that suggests that it's even good to get your phone out of your scope of view um, to help yourself be fully present. Um, with this experience. I welcome you to try new things, maybe get curious or interested in new ways of thinking or seeing. 
and engage respectfully with yourself, one another, and this space. This also includes taking care of your body needs. Um, feel free to, to step out of the presentation if you need to. Um, and, uh, and we will move ahead. Our goals for this evening are to, number one, become better connected to 2S LGBTQ plus affirming terminology, community, and supports. So that's, what do we mean even by the acronym? And what is there that exists for 2S LGBTQ plus youth and families? Number two, improve communication and understanding between 2S LGBTQ plus youth and their parents. So this is, I feel like I'm missing my, my like I, we're missing each other in communication. What can I do? We wanna give you some skills and tools this evening to help to answer that question. And finally, have fun. I'm going to read out a quote from Kai Cheng Tom. It's from her book, I Hope We Choose Love. I have come to believe that love, the feeling of love, the politics of love, the ethics and ideology and embodiment of love is the only good option in this time. I mean love that is kind but also honest. Love that is courageous and relentless and willing to break the rules and smash the system. Love that cares about people more than ideas, that prizes each and every one of us as essential and indispensable. I mean love that is compassionate and accountable. I mean love that confirms and reaffirms us as complex and fallible yet lovable anyway. Love that affirms us as human. That's from this book, I Hope We Choose Love. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, introduce ourselves. We're gonna start with you, Joe. Yeah, sure. Um, so hey everyone, thanks again for hopping on to this amazing workshop um, tonight. Um, to introduce myself a little bit, my name is Joanna. Uh, my friends call me Joe, so feel free to do so. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I started with PSN back in January, so I've been here for um, a few months now, and my role is the youth drop-in coordinator. So um, my responsibilities are really to make uh, safe and engaging and fun programming with our youth uh, in the Halton community. And um, yeah, and I'm really excited to be part of this team and to kind of meet everyone tonight. It's lovely to see everyone's faces. And I'll pass it on to Serena. <clears throat> Hi again, folks. Uh, so yes, uh, my name is Serena. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the resource coordinator for PSN, uh, which essentially means like building community, bridging community, uh, and networking with other service providers and supporting and meeting youth, which is really fantastic. Uh, I'm a Halton native, so I've grown up in Halton, and I bring my lived experience of someone who's queer uh, living in this area and hoping to help support youth in that way as well. So thanks for joining us. I'm Shaden. My pronouns are they, them, there, or Z them, zir. I am all about supporting the mental health and well-being of 2S LGBTQ plus youth and their parents, caregivers, and families. Uh, oh, I grew up in Sudbury, um, that's Tinnemishan and Anishinaabek territory, and they're uh, growing up as a queer youth, not really having a place. Um, it, uh, my experiences caused me to want to be one of those adults who won't forget what it's like to be a youth and who won't forget the importance of supporting youth. So that's my mission in life, it's my passion, and I'm so glad to be here. I just wanna make a note on language. So the 2S LGBTQ plus acronym. It stands for Two-Spirit, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans. Trans can include non-binary, gender expansive, transgender, transsexual. Um, so if someone identifies as trans, it's good to not assume what they mean by that. Uh, and it also includes the word queer. Um, there are many identities that don't find themselves uh, in that that shortened acronym. The, I think the longer acronym is 2SLGBTQQIA, um, but, but I want to invite you to take a look 
at this pie chart over here, notice this uh, 25%, almost 25% of the pie chart. This uh, comes from Project Query, which was a study done out of U of T in 2017, where they surveyed over 3,000 youth in North America about not just, it was about 2S LGBTQ plus technology, but one of the things that they asked was for people to self-identify their gender and sexuality. <clears throat> in terms of sexual orientation, almost 25% of respondents said that they identify as part of the pansexual umbrella. That's this section of the pie chart here. And yet P for pansexual doesn't find itself in the acronym. This is to say that language is constantly evolving and that the understanding of what each word that belongs in the 2SLGBTQ plus community or, or acronym or umbrella, we're never gonna capture it all. And even one person's experience as a lesbian is gonna be completely different from somebody else's experience as a lesbian based on their, their geographical location, their um, ethnicity, their uh, cis or trans status, um, their you know, financial background. There's gonna be all sorts of things that affect how it is that they experience that lesbianism. Um, so one of the things that we want is to share a little bit about what the acronym means, but also acknowledge that we're never going to get it all. And the only way to really connect with what it means to be part of this community for your youth is that that is, is to ask them directly what their experiences are like, how they see the world and how they experience their identity in the context of their environment. We're gonna share with you now a video. Um, it's five LGBTQ plus youth talking about their coming out stories. Everybody who's part of the community has a coming out story. And this is because everybody is assumed to be cis. So that's cisgendered as in not trans. Um, and everyone is assumed to be straight until otherwise. Now things are changing and maybe you're one of those uh, parents who maybe thought from very early on that, you know, so my kid's gender or sexual identity might be completely different from what most of society says is, is the mainstream. Um, but there is a process of coming out because a lot of us have to face the experience of people assuming that we're something that we're not. Even people who haven't come out yet or haven't come out in certain contexts have a story about what it's like to to not come out. So with that, we're gonna share this video. Cole Sprouse, if you're watching this, I love you. Coming out was more of just like a long form process since I knew around middle school that I was into, you know, more than just guys. I realized I was queer in high school. I was 14 years old when I was outed as being gay. Being outed was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. So I was actually 17 when I first came out, um, and it was a very organic process. My mom, after picking me up from school, took this weird drive that we never really take and then pulled over. I first came out as bi at the end of uh, eighth grade, the summer between eighth and ninth grade. I told my sister. She was the first person that I told. And it was really funny because I'd gone to public school prior to that and all of my friends uh, teased me. Oh, you're going to private school. It's all girls. You're going to become a lesbian. I was like, oh, you guys don't know anything. I'm so straight <laughs> and I'm just so not straight. I went to Catholic school and Sex homosexuality wasn't even a thing, so I doubt bisexuality would have even been a topic we could say in class. This girl got really drunk on Mike's Hard Lemonade, and I ended up taking her home in a cab, and I looked up at her and made eye contact with her, and like, it's just this weird feeling kind of rushed over my body, um, and I realized I just fallen in love with this girl out of nowhere who I didn't know. And then at that moment, I kind of knew the direction that she was heading towards. And she asked me very bluntly if I was gay. And already I could see in her eyes that there was no kind of malicious intent in her asking me. And so with tears in my eyes, I just kind of said, yeah, mom, I am gay. 
And I just started breaking down crying because it was so cathartic and my mom was just kind of looking at me like, it's not that serious. And so I would like come to school in like a skirt or something and someone would be like, oh my God, you're wearing a skirt. And I was like, guys, I, li I do this. Like I, that's always been something that I've done. And just because I'm a lesbian, like we're gonna make a whole big to do about the fact that I am wearing a skirt or makeup or something like that. I actually told my best friend that I was bi the first day that I moved into college. And by my sophomore year, I'd finally told everyone. Um, and I told them via Instagram. My dad was the only one who took it a little bit hard. He was more upset at the fact that I sent him a link to my Instagram post instead of calling him. Coming out as trans was a lot harder because I didn't have language to describe gender identity until I got to college. And yet, if you're not entirely sure of who or what you are from the second you come out of the womb, people like to invalidate what you have to say about who you are. If you're thinking of coming out to your parents and you're pretty sure they're accepting, maybe just tell them in person. Don't don't put it on Instagram and give them a link. But other than that, you know, it was a pretty positive experience and I wouldn't really regret it or change when I did it or how I did it. But it also taught me that coming out and sharing who you are doesn't necessarily need to be a grand gesture and a large experience. It can be very personal and it can be very intimate and it can just be you starting to live your life openly. So take a moment to let that video sink in. And in the context uh, of maybe what these youth were saying, maybe it resonated with you. Uh, maybe there were some examples of how it is that, that you would like to be in relationship with your youth, but here's a chance for you to check in with yourself. What are the values that matter most to you as a parent and how do you want to show up for your youth? Essentially, what kind of parent do you want to be? So go ahead at the bottom of your screen, you can go to your chat box and you can write in the chat, what are some of the qualities that you aspire to embody as a parent? Oh, beautiful. Accepting, welcoming understanding, open, available, someone to count on, supporting. Yeah, supportive, love, acceptance, inspire confidence, so good. I would like to be the parent my child needs me to be, not the parent I need to be. Whew. Love and complete acceptance, supportive parent, loving, accepting, unbiased love, so beautiful, such beautiful responses. Yes, kindness, respect, love, so good. So in the spirit of that, um, there, the next slide, we're gonna start talking about the challenges that to us LGBTQ plus youth might, uh, might experience. Now there's a lot of brilliance and resilience in the community and it's important, I think, to understand a little bit of the context that people are living in, in order to um, understand that, that, that resilience. Um, so the, this next slide, just to prepare you, can be a little bit hard to consider. Um, nothing specifically of, of uh, like nothing that I would note specifically in terms of the content, but just that it's, it can be challenging for us to acknowledge that, that the youth, um, that the, ch the child or the youth who we care so much about could experience oppression in, in the, the way the world works. And so this iceberg is here to represent for us that the tip of the, like it's really like the tip of the iceberg, the things that we see, the homophobic or transphobic um, graffiti or uh, comments that somebody might, that somebody might hear or see excluding someone based on their gender expression, assumptions about somebody, about who somebody is based on the way they present themselves or who, based on who they're dating, um, discrimination, prejudice. So that's the part that we see. The part that we don't see are the structures that, that keep that in place. So that, that, sort of, that can be 
pervasive um, common misunderstandings, beliefs, um, assumptions that get woven in to a, a broader culture. And some of the ways that those can get woven in are through policies, um, resource distribution in communities, or say for example, in a school where maybe the athletics team gets a whole lot more funding and a whole lot more teacher support than the GSA club, for example. The ways that priorities get distributed systematically uh, prop up or, or keep in place who it is that gets disadvantaged in, in broader society and who it is that gets advantaged. Of, um, and something, is so, even under the surface is, is silence. So when we don't have um, to us LGBTQ plus um, people in the media, role models who show us that, that you can be um, whoever you wanna be if you're, as long as you're supported and you're in who you are, uh, when we don't have queer and trans role models, then that can let lead to the, the message that it's not okay. So I think back to my graduate studies where on the first day of my ethics class, my professor uh, stood in front of the class and, and told us that she has an acquired brain injury. Now, she does this very intentionally at the, fir at the first of any semester, the first day on any semester that she teaches. One, to weed out students who would discriminate against her for, based on her disability. And then two, to make it okay to talk about disability in the class. Because when you don't talk about something, it sends the message that that thing, that thing is not okay to talk about. Representation matters. And so when, um, so I encourage all parents from when their children are young to, to think about what it could look like to have queer and trans uh, friendly authors or child books in the home um, or queer and trans friendly cartoons. Like that can do something in terms of somebody's own sense of acceptance of self. Um, what, part of what we see in terms of um, the mental health challenges that to us LGBTQ plus individuals and, and particularly youth experiences, it, it can be pervasive experiences, like experience after experience of discrimination or silencing or being left out or, or feeling like they're not normal or like they don't fit in, that can lead to a buildup of stress hormones in the body and can, um, and can act to, um, to challenge a, a, a growing system. So that could be like it can lead to um, hypertension it can, and it can lead to challenges in terms of brain function. It's really hard to focus in class when you're worried about how somebody's going to look at you, let alone uh, worried about more aggravated forms of bullying or harassment. This is to say that being 2SLGBTQ plus doesn't make life hard. It's the oppression that makes life hard. This is why it's so important for us to be talking about to us LGBTQ plus mental health. We do see um, in the community, in the queer and trans community, um, a, a slightly larger proportion of more aggravated mental health challenges. Now, one of the things that is so important for us this evening, for us to be having this conversation, is that the number one mitigating factor, the number one um, factor that promotes positive mental health outcomes, at least for trans youth, is unconditional acceptance from their parents. So, I mean, the stats, um, I'm not going to shy away from the stats. Youth who do not experience uh, parental support, trans youth who do not experience parental support, experience an, a 46% chance of attempting suicide in their life. That number drops to 4%. So it reduces by 10 times when they have at least one unconditionally accepting parent. It is the most important thing in terms of the mental health of our youth to have you here in order to build your knowledge and, and learn new ways to engage with your youth so that you can convey your acceptance to them. 
this is what will be the thing that that most defines their well-being in life. Now, this isn't also to scare you because there are some times when, you know, we're we're never going to be the perfect parent or perfect in all situations. It's really about being good enough and striving towards acceptance in all ways, including all aspects of their identity and who they choose to be. Now, I'm going to move to um, something called the triphasic brain model. There's been, there is a lot of research that has been emerging in the last 10 years around neurobiology and how that applies to psychotherapy practice. Um, and it's a, it's a timely, it's, as well as parenting, frankly. Um, and it's, it's, so it's a very timely topic. Uh, this brain model comes from Dan Siegel. So, so if you can imagine my hand is my brain. It's like if my head is like this, this is what my brain looks like. This is what it looks like. At the back of our heads is the brainstem back here. The brainstem is what some of us call the lizard brain. It was the very first part of the brain to evolve. It's the first part of the brain that develops in utero. It is what, what governs heart rate, um, whether our eyes water, it, it governs temperature regulation, all the things that in our bodies that we don't have to think about. It also is able to sense danger. And when, um, when the brainstem senses that there's danger, then it goes into shutdown mode. So if you think about a lizard that freezes on a rock um, because they're afraid or, you know, they're, try they're trying to hide from danger, that's, that, that's the lizard brain. And we have that too. The only part of the, of the uh, brainstem that we are able to influence is, is our breathing. So when you hear about people saying take three breaths or take a deep breath or exhale slowly or notice your breathing. That's very intentional. It connects by doing those things. We connect to the brainstem to the most basic part of our brain and we send the message that it's okay. In the middle of the brain. So about there, um, there are two almond shaped parts of the brain called the amygdala and the amygdala is called the mammalian brain. It's where we connect uh, socially. It's also, it also happens to be where we also, we also sense danger in there. And that is the place where we initiate fight or flight. That's the part of the brain that helps us fight harder, run faster, and get ourselves out of danger, which is so helpful. If you think about as a species, how it is that we've been able to stay uh, alive for so long, um, one of the reasons is we're able to run away from bears if we're in a forest. If there's no bear and there's no forest, this part of the brain doesn't know how to differentiate the difference between a side eye look that makes me feel excluded and shamed and, and a bear. This, this part only registers danger or safety. Next is the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, also what I call the thinky thinky part of the brain. So the thinking part of the, the thinky thinky part or the prefrontal cortex is where we store language. It's where we um, make, uh, prioritize our lives, uh, time management, long-term thinking, thinking about consequences. In, in other words, um, like the technical term is executive functioning. So that all exists in here. Now our brains are very adaptive. So if our, we sense that there's danger, it's like we flip our lid, the thinky thinky part turns off and then we move directly to survival mode. So it could happen that your teen has had a rough day. Maybe there's been some, I mean, um, right now we're, we're, all in, uh, we're all in similar circumstances, but maybe this youth went to a Zoom classroom and saw somebody who, uh, has said transphobic, homophobic things to them before. Um, it was awful seeing that person. And that person made some kind of like snide comment, whether that was directed to them or not. They come out of their room and then you say, hey, do you want a peanut butter sandwich? And they yell back, I hate peanut butter, you know that, right? Um, you know, there's nothing that you, 
intended to project, but when there's a buildup of stress in the system, it's more likely for the prefrontal cortex to go offline and for that person, that young person, to experience what, what, what you intended as an act of care to in fact get registered as, um, as a threat. Now, this is really confusing at first if we don't understand why it is that we can't like reason or rationalize. We might go after the, the young person and say, I was just trying to make you lunch. And then they yell even more, ah, it's not working. So there's a strategy for how it is that you can connect with, with your young person who's, who's in that state of mind. First of all, you have to regulate. And so that brainstem, the amygdala, as, as much as they're not, um, the thinky thinky parts, they are registering and picking up all sorts of information from the heart rate, from breathing, from muscle tension, that's telling them whether things are safe or not. And interestingly enough, somebody can pick up on your nervous system. Have you ever been sitting in a lunchroom and somebody comes in and all of a sudden the conversation stops and you can't really pinpoint why? Maybe it's because that person's nervous system is highly activated and you're picking up on the signal that, ooh, maybe I should be paying attention to something else right now. So regulating yourself and your own nervous system before you come back to engage with the, with the person is, is key, is critical. So how do you do that? You feel your feet on the floor. You feel the weight of your body on the chair. You feel the support of the chair against your back. You take a deep breath. You pay attention to your exhale. You notice your heart rate. Is it still up? Well, then maybe you need more time before you re-engage. And as your nervous system comes down, then you become ready to then be the bigger, stronger nervous system for this young person to ping off of, to notice that there's safety in there uh, or that there's safety in the engagement and that, whew, helps them to come down. And then you relate to them. And you can do this, um, the picture shows the, um, the adults hugging the young person. That can be a way of relating. So physically like sending signals that it's okay, like, like things like hugging, rocking, depending on the relationship that you have with your young person. And it can also mean naming the emotional experience. Like, wow, you seem really angry right now. And I wonder if something really hard has happened today. And we don't have to jump right away into what it is that happened. Maybe that person just needs to come down before they can start talking about it, before they can start using their words. Because only once they have come down, can they, um, can they really reason with you? Can they really access their language? Can they really access... Um, problem solving about how it is that they're going to address that bully who's now in their Zoom class, in other words, is now in their home. Um, really quickly, I'm going to run through the five secrets of effective communication. Um, first of all, we want to be, uh, we want to be empathic, assertive, and respectful. Um, we want to pay attention to the thoughts, the rationalization, um, that somebody's sharing with us, find whatever it is that, that you can agree with. What's the truth of the statement? What's the part that I can't agree with? And next, making space for the feeling of the person. So that's the relating part of the, um, of the three R's. So make space for their feelings. Ask thoughtful, gentle questions into their experience so that that can help to uncover maybe what are some of the underlying challenges that this young person is experiencing. It's also okay to have boundaries. So once the three R's have, have happened, right? Once we've, we've regulated ourselves and we've, we've regulated each other and we've related with each other, um, it's okay to, be, to say, you know what? Yelling, when you yelled like that, it, it really activated something in me and, and it upset me that I... Uh, that I, I felt like I was being shot out of the room with your, with your volume. I wonder if it's possible to get to a place where there's no shouting in the house, right? Um, because that needs to be a rule here. It's okay to be a 
assertive with compassion linked into it. And then making sure that that respect for the person is still intact. Resourcing our youth includes supporting them at school, at home, with, uh, with immediate and extended family. It includes mental health support, so we're here for that at Rock. It includes community support, it's really what we're doing at PSN, and it can include affirming medical support as well, particularly when we're talking about, uh, well, when we're talking about like our bodies, that can, that can that can be so laden. And so to have a 2SLGBTQ plus affirming physician, primary physician can, can make a world of difference for our young person. So what do you do when family members are not on board? So remember um, empathy, uh, assertiveness, and respectfulness. So say, say I'm at a family dinner and my sister says something, uh, you know, something snide and homophobic. Whew. Maybe she says something like, I don't think that traditional family values should be um, thrown, on, thrown upside down. Okay, so how can I find the truth in that statement? My truth becomes, I also believe that family values should not be turned upside down. Those family values for me include acceptance, unconditional love, and they don't include judgment, right? So, so I'm looking for the truth in the statement, and it's like, it's also emotional empathy, like I know that you're really frustrated about this, and, and then it can turn to assertiveness. It's like, and we have a young person here who is negatively impacted by those statements, and I'm not going to come to dinner until you've addressed what that is. I'm respect. I'm going to support you. I will give you some books. I will give you some articles and I will talk it through with you. So, um, so imagine my sister is the teal circle in the bullseye. Um, I'm using ear towards her. I'm also checking in with the four C's. Am I compassionate, calm, curious, and connected? If not, probably not a good time to have the conversation. Good time for me to check out, take some space, regulate myself, take a breath, or several, or a week, or several, before I can like fully process how it is that I'm going to approach her. Compassionate, calm, curious, connected means that I am grounded and centered and ready for the conversation. And then I'm not going to go to that person for support. I'm going to look, I'm going to go to my own support network to ensure that I'm being supported in this difficult conversation. It's emotionally trying. It's what it means to be an ally to your youth. And Serena is going to take it away. We're going to talk about uh, community supports and advocacy in the school. Yeah. Hi, folks. So I'm going to just talk about uh, advocating and if there's some youth here on behalf of yourself or on like for yourself or on behalf of, of your youth. So I'm going to talk about some examples. Uh, these are suggestions of processes that you can take. Uh, one example is going to be in school and then the other example is going to be out in the community. Um, so going forward, uh, so the example that I'm going to use in terms of school is say your youth uh, come up comes across a teacher uh, who, I'm sorry, can you folks hear my puppy in the background? Yeah. Um, the teacher of your youth is intentionally using the wrong name uh, and is intentionally using the wrong pronouns, even though uh, it has, the youth has already indicated the name and pronouns that they want to use. Um, also noting that a youth's legal name doesn't need to be changed for their uh, name to be changed on their school records. Um, so the first thing is, do you feel comfortable talking with the social workers of that school, talking with the teachers or other faculty to kind of get a resolution in what's happening? Um, and then the next process, if there's no answer or resolution, is seeking out the principal to be able to discuss the matter. You know, is this person taking action? If this teacher is intentionally using the wrong name and the wrong pronouns, that's doing damage, that's doing harm, right? Uh, so what I've noted here, hopefully you folks can see, is if you don't get a response from the principal, you could then reach out to Mary Marshall, 
uh, who's the principal of equity and inclusion, or the superintendent uh, of the district, the Halton District School Board. Uh, so this is based on the Halton District School Board, not the Catholic District School Board, but processes would be the same. Um, and then going forward, if you don't get a response, you could always uh, seek out your school board trustee or the board in general, and perhaps advocate on their behalf of what's happening. And then uh, what's accessible to you as well is uh, filing a complaint with the Ontario Human Rights Commission uh, because it is, it is the law, right? If somebody um, is intentionally doing someone's harm and is not, um, it's a policy based on somebody's gender identity and gender expression. So it is a code, it is a law. If somebody is breaking this, you can make a complaint and you can also uh, contact your ombudsman. Uh, so, and then yeah, reach out to PSN for support and information, right? If, if you need support in some of this advocacy or resources, uh, feel free to contact us and I know hopefully our contact information will be, and then going to the next slide. Um, yeah, so these, I invite you to maybe potentially become familiar with uh, the, these human rights codes. Um, and also know, because oh, oftentimes we didn't know ourselves. So the school boards have guidelines for supporting gender diverse youth. Uh, this also considers somebody's sexual orientation uh, to things like pronouns, uh, gender, like washroom access, um, sports teams. So it's, it's a good tool to know. And it, basically these guidelines are created in order for faculty, teachers, uh, and the school board to know like to be able to respect and create a supportive um, learning environment, right? Um, because oftentimes we have youth who will come to us and there's sometimes very neg negative experiences that are happening and being condoned in schools. So, and then going to the next slide, um, you folks are also invited or your youth to go to delegations. So in front of, uh, your trustees or the board in general, say if it's seeking more supports or resources for your youth in schools specifically, um, this way it is documented, it is public, um, and you know, when things are documented in public, things tend to happen and move a lot quicker. So just know that that's accessible to you. And then going forward real quickly is talking about uh, a situation in the community say your youth is going to a summer camp and they're really, really excited. And the example I'm gonna use here is uh, something that's happened in the past. So say your youth are attending a camp together um, and they'd like to host a pride dance. And the, res the response from the counselors is that um, having a pride dance might make, feel, make others feel uncomfortable and that it's not representative of everybody's beliefs. Okay, so what can you do, right, in terms of the situation? And do you feel comfortable? Again, at the end of the day, it's your decision on how you want, wish to proceed um, for the youth or on behalf of the youth. So it's like contacting the recreation center, the counselor, the manager, or the director. No response. Do you feel comfortable? Um, most rec centers are run by municipalities and reaching out to the city or the public relations of the city. And then noting. Um, going further, was there resolution, right? And is there advocacy that can be done? Are there policies in terms of anti-harassment and anti-discrimination? Would you feel confident, you know, that other youth coming into the same building wouldn't also experience maybe homophobic or transphobic uh, comments or experiences? And then again, just like before, uh, you could always file a complaint under the Human Rights Commission or contact your ombudsman who does investigations uh, for public complaints. And then noting really quickly as well, there's a policy on discrimination and harassment because of sexual orientation. Um, really two good points of policy and just things that are accessible to you folks that we've just learned and wanna pass forward as like a plethora of knowledge. So I hope it, uh, it helps. I hope you might not need it, but I hope it helps if you ever do need it, so. All right, this next slide is a video um, with Dr. James McCocus, who is probably a personal hero slash celebrity uh, in my world. 
Um, and you might know him from winning the Great Amazing Race Canada circa 2019. Definitely worth the watch. Sorry for the spoiler. And um, we're not going to, we're running a little tight on time, but we are, we wanted to show this video because it shows what trans and gender affirming uh, cultural, culturally relevant uh, healthcare looks like. So go ahead and look at it up on AJ Plus. Um, the title is at the top. We're not going to show it this evening, uh, but like, do do feel free to take a look. It's it's certainly worth it. Makes me tear up almost every time. This person's amazing. All right. Handing this over to you, Joe. This is a snapshot of what PSN offers to you. And your Beautiful. Years. Thanks, Jaden. Um, okay, so just uh, quickly here, you can take a look at um, what PSN and Rock have to offer. Um, I'm not going to go through everything just in the essence of time, but I will highlight um, Rock's walk in clinical services as well as. PSN's um, drop-in programming and what both of those look like virtually right now. Um, so I'll start with Rock's virtual walk-in services. So these services, um, they basically act as a, a front door service to access um, all services for families with children 17 years old, um, for children up to 17 years old. Um, and it allows an entire family to come or uh, individual members of a family to receive access during the walk-in hours. Um, because all person, all in-person clinics um, and, and programming are suspended right now, um, Rock has just recently opened up their virtual walk-in, which is amazing and a service that many people have um, found great use of. Um, so you can access this by visiting Rock's um, website uh, where you will be greeted and you will see our new digital assistant, Quinn. Um, and Quinn will then connect you to a therapist um, on either, Quinn is available um, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 12 o'clock until three o'clock. So those are the virtual walk-in um, hours. Joe, can I make a point? Absolutely. Okay. So if you go to the rockonline.ca website, the chat box for Quinn is there. Uh, Quinn is accessible throughout the week, I believe. But the it's the Rock Walk-in that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, twelve till three. So Quinn is there to answer your questions as well about how to how to direct your quest how to direct your queries. Awesome. Um, and so on to PSN's virtual drop-in programming now, just quickly. Um, our if you're not familiar with our programming, um, they are basically designed. Um, to be safer spaces for LGBTQ plus youth um, in the Halton region. Um, we have taken our in-person programming uh, virtually as of March or April, and we will continue to do this for the next couple of months. Um, these programming schedules will follow our in-person programming schedule, and so that's five programs a month. I just wanna quickly highlight one of these programs called Connections. <clears throat> right there where Shay's um, pointing that out. So Connections is our uh, program for gender creative, gender independent, and trans and or non-binary youth. Um, and it's a really special program because we hold three separate groups within that program. We have our unicorn club, so for children as young as six years old to 12. We hold the adolescent group, which is ages 13 to 24. And we also hold our parent and caregiver group. Um, and that parent caregiver group is a really great resource for um, those who are on this call. If you're interested in joining that, it's a great resource, great place to share resources with one another for our facilitators um, who join you in that group. They share resources um, and personal, personal stories and information that um, you might, that might be of use to you. Um, and also just a great place to support one another. And so I just wanna note that if you are interested in learning more about that parent caregiver group, you can um, message me privately in this chat um, and write down your email so that I can note it down um, because we have a MailChimp and we send out information regarding that group um, when programming, when it comes time to programming. Um, so if you wish to do that, we can definitely help you out with that. Um, and just very quickly, we have four 
other programs that are run specifically for youth age 12 to 24. And so you can find all the scheduling on um, our Instagram. So we can post our Instagram handle at the end of this presentation as well for you to check out our programming um, that you will be seeing virtually in the next coming months. Awesome. So this is what our poster for the monthly drop-ins looks like and our connections. Mm -hmm. Cool. We also want to make mention that Peace Like Halton has been an, um, an incredible support in terms of putting this presentation together. Uh, we've had an excellent time collaborating. So do check them out. Um, they, so P flag stands for parents and friends of lesbians and gays. Basically, it's like if there's someone in your life who's to us LGBTQ plus and you care about them and you want to know how to best support them and how to be a, how to be a good ally, then check out pflagcanada.halton. They're also, they're also on Facebook and they are always looking for volunteers. Now, in terms of other community resources, uh, we want to point out a couple that are available to your youth. Um, this one is LGBT Youth Line. It's based out of the GTA. There is a 1-800 number, a text for peer support, as well as online chat with a peer support volunteer. It is not a crisis service. It's really like peer-to-peer -peer support. So if your young person is feeling uh, kind of lonely or disconnected from the broader LGBTQ plus community, this is a good place for them to start to chat with a peer volunteer um, to, 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 to have some of that connection. Trans Lifeline is a crisis line for uh, trans, non-binary, gender expansive, gender independent, uh, people of all ages. Um, and the number here is the Canadian number, which is hard to find on their website. Uh, they were primarily, they were originally based in the US. So if you think that would be an important reason for you, I do recommend that you jot down this 1877 number uh, so that you have access to it. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier uh, in this presentation, it's so important to have representation. ItGetsBetter.org is all about providing youth with the hope that high school is not to be the rest of their lives. So if they're struggling with what it's like to be 2SLGBTQ plus in, um, in their high school or in their, like in their school environment or even in the context of their extended family, just knowing that that it can get better and that for so many of us it does um that's what this the it gets better project is about there's hundreds of videos online where people are sharing their own personal stories one thing that's that's um really common in the 2 lgbtq plus community is this concept of chosen family that even when we have family members who aren't 100 percent accepting that we can find people uh, in our communities who become so close that they they become not just that they are like our family but they become our family as well um, it gets better has videos of people who talk about their chosen family as as well in terms of, of offering youth a sense of hope of possible in their lives there's some great podcasts out there i'm a big fan of uh alex Ian taffy they're a mentor of mine um and they do this podcast called gender stories and and it's for p this is for you too actually where if you have someone in your life who's trans or and or non-binary um gender stories hosts interviews with all types of people about their gender cis trans non-binary whatever because everyone has a story of of their coming into their own gender um, these other ones are also great oh um one thing that i want to add is psn also has a library so we have great books gender workbook over here transgender teen Transgender Teen Survival Guide, Gender Creative Child. Um, these are great books and PSN does allow parents and youth to sign out books uh, to borrow them for themselves. So that's a resource that's gonna come back onto the shelves uh, when we resume in-person programming. 
So huge gratitudes go to Health and Families for Families, especially you, Berea Rosa, for spearheading this and making it happen. Um, huge gratitude to my co-presenters, Joe and Rena. I think Kelly is in the audience. Hey, Kelly. Um, thank you to all of you for showing up. Also, a uh, million thanks forever for to Rock, um, to the work that's being done through P Flag Halton and also Lisa Wiley Consulting consulted with us in preparing this presentation this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. We're at 8.13. So we have kind of really gone into our QA period. So sorry about that. If folks are wanting to hang out another 15 minutes until 8.30, we're so happy to hang around. Um, if you have to go, we understand. We won't take it personally. Um, thanks so much for being here and we will move into the Q&A.